So Chris, uh, you were the production designer on Stranger Things, one of the uh, big breakout hits of this TV season. Uh, how do you account for the massive success of this show? Um, I, I don't know. There's so many factors. I, I, you know, I'd like to think that the world we created physically is part of the success, obviously, but I think it's, you know, um, we're really lucky uh, from the Duffers on down. Like it was, everyone was really passionate uh, about the, about the project. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of space, you know, to, to do exactly what we wanted to do. Um, you know, I, I like, I like to think that, that the, the sort of, the texture of the whole thing and, and, and the sort of uh, moving, getting away from, uh, you know, slick, fast, social media centric, sort of uh, fast cutting, modern uh, TV making had a lot to do with it. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really charming show, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and the show has also uh, gotten some awards buzz, uh, winning at the Producers Guild, the Screen Actors Guild, and you yourself were personally nominated at the Art Directors Guild uh, for the first time. What did that kind of recognition mean for you? Um, it was, I don't, I mean, I, I, it was slightly shocking, you know, I mean, I, we really, it, we didn't necessarily know that people were going to connect with the show the way they did, so, um, you know, and I, 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 I kind of have, you know, clawed my way up from the indie world. So it was a, it was a huge sort of, uh, it was a huge shift. It's very, I don't know, it's very exciting. I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been incredible. It's really exciting that like, you know, people love the show as much as, as we do, you know. Well, like you said, you've got a background in independent features and this is like an eight hour feature film. I wonder, I mean, working on a, a television schedule, did your background in independent features kind of help prepare you for the kind of schedule that this would entail? I, I think so, actually. I mean, just being able to sort of, uh, you know, improvise and work within pretty intense uh, time constraints and occasionally, you know, just resource resource constraints. Although, you know, to to Netflix's credits, they they really they really did give us sort of what we needed to make the show we had in mind. But but yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I think uh, indie movie making is uh, as good a boot camp as you can really get for for every other level of uh, of filmmaking. So yeah, of course. Well, let's talk a little bit about your work because there's a lot to uh, chew on here. Um, first off, I mean, the show is really unique in that it both plays on nostalgia for 80s classics like uh, E.T. and Stand By Me, but you also take a very modern approach to it. So I wonder what your like initial ideas or inspirations were for this show. I mean, you know, there are, of course, you know, they're, they're the, the obvious and essential sort of uh, Spielberg, Carpenter, Stephen King, you know, all of these sort of touchstones of, of uh, early 80s, late 70s American movie making. But, you know, for me, I always come from, from a, a little bit yeah, grittier, more uh, textural uh, side. So, you know, uh, as soon as the Duffers and I started talking about Silkwood and Altered States and uh, Clute and, uh, you know, the conversation, it's those, that's kind of where I really, you know, my, my attention was really uh, peaked. So yeah, I mean, I feel like, I feel like that's also part of what makes it special um, is that, you know, being able to bring some of the, the sort of realism of indie filmmaking to, to like the, the magical wonder of, of that sort of early eighties world. I mean, and that was important to all of us, you know, being true to, to like, Creating a world that you that you believe in that you that has has grit and gravity, but also you know, maintaining that sort of Spielbergian sense of wonder and you know, uh, adventure. You mentioned grittiness and uh, Silkwood. I mean, that brings me to another point about the show, which is that it's about blue collar working class people. You know, it's set in a small uh, Indiana town. It's not about uh, upper class people. It's really about uh, people who are struggling to pay their bills, like Winona Ryder's character. You know, can you talk a little bit about creating that kind of um, environment for the characters? Sure, I mean, you know, that, that just like, it's a testament to like, the, to the approach, I think, you know, I mean, for all of us, uh, particularly my team and I, I mean, the first thing we do as we read the scripts is start to get a feel for who these people are, you know, how they would live, you know, trying to understand the sort of socioeconomic context of the characters and uh and you know and be true to that as we as we create these sets so that you know when you're watching um 
you know, our, our, our goal is always to inform the characters with the sets and not so much to distract, which is tricky when you're doing uh, 80s period, because I think everybody is waiting for, you know, the neon and the shoulder pads and the pastel. <laughs> you know, everyone kind of is thinking Miami Vice, you know, through a lens of that 70s show or something like that, which there are two incredible things, but, you know, we really wanted to, to do something that was, you know, that really kind of drew, draws viewers in and sort of you, you kind of lose track of the fact that it's the 80s. You know, it doesn't really, it's not glaring. It's not, you're not preoccupied with the fact that this is a show that's set in the 80s. I mean, of course, our props and some of our sort of intentional winks and nods to the things that inspired us, you know, posters, bikes, walkie talkies, all of that. But I mean, we try to integrate that stuff in a way that kind of feels seamless in creating a, a very real world. You know, I think that's, I mean, that's kind of, that's basic to the whole thing is like, you know, let's make sure that everybody believes, believes these characters and, and believes the sort of context of these characters and, you know, who they are and where they live and, you know, the stuff that would be on their counters, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you bring up the, uh, the fact that it's set in the eighties and I wonder, I mean, how much, um, like research did you have to do? Cause I mean, it's early eighties. And so I'm guessing there's kind of like a, a bleed over from the late seventies still in there, or, I mean, how much did the period affect it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, I mean, we started with really, really intensive. We just scoured, uh, all of the media from the, from the time, you know, from, from the late sixties all the way on up through, you know, 83, which is uh, present day in our story. And, and really just tried to kind of, you know, immerse ourselves in that world and get a real feel for sort of the, the, the tone and the texture of it. And, you know, uh, obviously, you know, almost exclusively, we, we shopped all vintage elements. I mean, you know, down to wallpaper, floor tile, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's important to sort of figure out, you know, Joyce Byers house clearly hasn't been redecorated since the early seventies, if, if not even later, you know, so, um, you know, just being really careful about what the particular characters would or wouldn't have in their houses, you know, and then, you know, the Wheeler house as a counterpoint, you know, Karen is clearly keeping up with the, uh, the latest home journals and, you know, it's, it's much more distinctly aspirational, you know, Ted's doing well, they live in a nicer home in the suburb, you know, it's, she, uh, she's trying to, to present very like, very like up to the moment, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that was, it definitely, we we're definitely able to define define characters by by you know the subtle differences in uh, in in just how how recently you know they decorated or didn't decorate you know. And then I mean, setting the show in Indiana as well. What did that uh, add to your work? I mean, it's a very it, the show has a very uh, specific sense of place, uh, which is another great quality of it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think initially, initially, you know, I think this is uh, common knowledge, you know, it was, it was called Montauk. It was meant to be set in a more sort of like uh, literally Montauk essentially, which is a more seaside uh, Amity esque sort of uh, town. Um, but as we scouted and we discussed sort of what we were trying to do and, you know, how we were trying to connect with audiences, I mean, it became, it, it made more sense that we attempt something that's a little bit more identifiably like anywhere USA, you know, so that like, got a bit of a broader, uh, just a bit of, more easy to connect to more broadly. So, so yeah, I mean, and, and Indiana just kind of, you know, geographically, it's very Midwest. It's very like, there's something sort of, you know, fundamentally Americana about, about it. So yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was definitely very deliberate. Um, and then, you know, I, you may know, as people do, we shot in Atlanta, which was really great because, it allowed for a lot of, uh, there's just, you know, Atlanta's, Atlanta's just really full of incredible suburbs that are very distinctly like mid-century American through the seventies, you know? So we were able to, to find these, these kind of neighborhoods that are like just quintessential American neighborhood kind of, no matter where you were, uh, this is what suburban America looked like, you know, in mid-century through the seventies. So that was very, uh, that was very helpful. And also within the show, you've got these fantastical elements, these sci-fi horror elements, and you've got uh, the upside down, which you had to create. Can you talk a bit about coming up with that and, and uh, what your ideas were? Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, was 
probably one of the most challenging elements in terms of like creative collaboration because it really required, you know, all departments to contribute, you know, and, and, you know, it's easy to talk about something. It's very abstract. Mm -hmm. um, it was easy for us to talk about like, Oh, it's, it's this kind of dark shadow of our world and it's got, it's, it feels infected and it's got sort of spores floating around and all this. And it's, there's, it's, 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 it's got some growths that, that feel like almost cancerous or, or something. So, so we were able to kind of discuss it, but then it was just a matter of like, the real work came when it was, how do we physically realize this? You know, like, what does the lighting look like? How do we create a murkiness, a physical murkiness? Uh, you know, what kind of materials do we use to create, you know, vines and membranes and, you know, on, on, a, on a fairly large scale. I mean, we were like covering, you know, large areas with this stuff. So that was actually really challenging. And I mean, I think that's where it, you know, it's a testament to how well everybody, you know, collaborated creatively and, uh, you know, just how open everyone was to everyone else's suggestions in terms of, you know, my department and special effects and visual effects and the directors and the cinematographer and sound design. It was a, it was definitely, I feel like that's where the, the, the chaos was really brought under control, you know, and I think uh, everyone's really happy with what we ended up with. Right. Uh, the, the last uh, kind of uh, seminal part of this show is all these government buildings that you're in, uh, all of the stuff with uh, the people who are after 11. Can you talk about, because uh, I mean, it's such a cold contrast to everything else that we have in the show. Can you talk about creating that? Sure, yeah. I mean, that was, uh, you know, it was, really, it was basically, it was important to us that it felt like something that was initiated in, during the, you know, the height of the Cold War, you know. Uh, so the idea was basically this is, uh, you know, this is a government institution, it's a government building that's, you know, secret, obviously. And, uh, you know, they've been, they've been playing around with, you know, uh, anything interesting to them in terms of uh, psychic warfare, or whatever. So, th so the idea was that basically uh, we, we find this lab after it's already been through, you know, a number of different, you know, iterations of, of attempting to, you know, create various fringy, fringe science sort of weaponry. And uh, so that was the idea in terms of, in terms of aesthetically, I, you know, I was also inspired a little bit by China syndrome, I'll be honest, the uh, mm. that incredible nuclear reactor space there. But so we kind of, we wanted to get that, that sort of government, uh, government facility, mid-century Cold War government facility that's been um, repurposed a number of times and, you know, retrofitted to, to you know, accommodate whatever weird uh, purpose they're they're uh, pursuing at the moment. So that was that, and then we found this incredible building uh, in Atlanta again uh, that actually had previously been a mental health facility. So it already had this, and oddly, this this strange aura or air about it. You know, that was it was already a little bit like unsettling to be inside this space. Um, so from there, that's the exterior of the building, and then we were inspired by some of their corridors and and some of their laboratories and all that stuff to, to create what we created um, as far as the lab and, and that goes. You know, the idea is that it's this you know, it's deep underground kind of a thing in, uh, in, in, in more ways than one. And the show is unique in that it's only, in the first season it was only helmed by uh, the Duffer Brothers and Sean Levy. I wonder what that collaboration was like and you know, what they gave you that helped you in your work. Um, they're, they're pretty fantastic. I can't really say enough good about them. You know. um, the brothers, I've known them for a little while. Uh, they pitched me this project when it was like a glimmer in their eye and I was immediately in love with it. And I was like, please, you know, I'd love to be your guy if ever this thing, you know, comes to fruition. And shortly thereafter it did. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they were like complete, completely collaborative from the start. I mean, they really, we were, we were just on the same page from the jump. And, you know, from the, from the first lookbook that I put together, <clears throat> we were all fairly certain, you know, we all essentially were like, this is what, this is what this show looks like, you know. And Sean Levy, to his to his credit, was incredibly supportive and really understood the project from the very beginning. I think, and I think the I think the Duffer Brothers and all of us were really, really lucky to have a shepherd like Sean Levy because I mean, he he, he gave it a hundred and fifty percent. I mean, he made sure that you know a bunch of sort of upstart, uh, you know, upstart young filmmakers um, had his sort of backing. And I think that had a lot to do with us being able to pull off what we pulled off and, and you know, to, to not hear too many no's in the process, you know.
Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was it was an, it was a pretty uh, it was a perfect storm of uh, of folks involved. I think you know, and keeping it really small and intimate, I think, is what allowed us to to maintain this sort of like. I mean, it you know, it feels like something that a handful of people put a lot of love into. It doesn't feel like a, a, a show or a movie made by committee, I don't think. And that has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, Sean and the Duffers were, were so precious with it. So, you know, kudos to them. Absolutely. Now you guys just wrapped season two, is that right? That is right, yeah, after it was a, it was a long shoot. <laughs> uh, I know you can't spoil anything, nor would we want you to, but is there any indication that you can give us of what we can expect or? Um, yeah, I mean, suffice it to say, it more than delivers on the promise of of season one. Um, I think it's got the same heart as season one. I think you still got your like lovable misfits on a misadventure, and you know it's going to be, uh, you know, even more sort of thrills and 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 spills and chills, etc. Um, you know, and I think having proven ourselves with season one, uh, at least to you know Netflix's satisfaction. Um, you know, we, we got a little more latitude this season to kind of go bigger with some of the stuff. So you can expect some, you know, some pretty fantastic sets, you know, some stuff that maybe uh, another show might have done green screen. Um, you know, we were able to to build and, and you know, keep our sort of, keep our physical uh, our physical effects world going. So, so yeah, it's gonna be really exciting. There's some really fun new characters and um, some really good twists. It's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome, yeah. Well, I look forward to it, and I know I'm not the only one. Uh, Chris, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on your work. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good one.